Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the first of the MASD Awareness Day webinars supported by the Harm Free Care Network and Medline. Just to let you know this session is being recorded. So today we are delighted to have Jackie Fletcher OBE as our speaker today. As many of you know, Jackie is a highly respected authority on tissue viability and in particular her work on Stop the Pressure programme. She also served as, as an executive for the European Pressure Alter Advisory Panel, UPAP, where as a working group lead, she was instrumental in de developing the pressure ulcer guidelines that shape our clinical practice today. She is also editor of Wounds UK. Today, she's going to talk to us about the best practice recommendations for the prevention and management of moisture associated skin damage. Everyone will be on mute throughout the session, so please put your questions into the Q&A panel. So you'll see the button at the top of your screen uh, and, and we will answer these questions at the end. OK. Just get the technology right, Julie, I'll put you on the screen. There we go. Thank you, Simon. Am I good to go? Yep, good to go. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session on the prevention and management of moisture associated skin damage. I need to start by saying that this session is not part of my National Wound Care Strategy or NHS England work, that it's part of a consultancy work. So what I'm aiming to achieve by the end of this session is that you should all have an understanding of what we mean by moisture associated skin damage, be able to identify the four main types, describe how to assess the skin and appreciate how we might best protect it. And I want to start from a point of, um, Simon mentioned my passion about pressure ulcers. And when, when I generally talk about pressure ulcers, there's a lot of focus on the skin. And I think it's important to say that we should be protecting the skin, whatever wound etiology we're interested in. We tend to get very hooked up and we're a leg ulcer person or a pressure ulcer person or whatever that might be. But the common theme in every kind of wound type is the skin. And we really need to think about how we protect the skin and keep it clean and dry. And that really is fundamentally what we're going to be talking about today. So if you want a good overview about moisture associated skin damage, can I recommend this document? It's a best practice statement on the management of MASD published in 2020. It's free to download and you can see the reference there at the bottom. So if you just go to the Wound UK website, you can download this. But the reason that we're talking about moisture associated skin damage is because it is a problem both for us as care providers, but also it does have a significant negative effect on the patient's well-being and on their quality of life. If you ask the patient what symptoms about their wounds bothered them, they will frequently tell you that it's leakage or smell, and smell often relates to leakage. So alongside pain, those two seem to be the most common factors and are often the ones that lead to something like social isolation. So when we're talking about moisture associated skin damage, we're broadly speaking about these four key wound etiologies, incontinence associated dermatitis or IAD, peristomal dermatitis, intertriginous dermatitis or intertrigo and peri-wound maceration. And if we think about those, there are some really common things, but there are multiple factors that are involved. So all of them relate to both fluid, but also the chemical irritants that are within the moisture source. So it's rarely clear water that causes the harm. It's saliva or exudate or urine or feces. And each of those has got chemical components, which are the things that cause the painful damage to the skin. It's also the microorganisms on the skin, the commensal skin flora, and what that fluid and those um, other metabolites and things cause in change of things like pH, which changes the microorganisms. And then there are external factors like mechanical factors like friction, particularly if you are thinking about randostoma, if you're thinking about on the bottom, those things also can cause significant problems and make the impact of the fluid much more. We need to think about is moisture associated skin damage a problem? So there's a huge focus 
on wounds such as pressure ulcers and leg ulcers. But actually, if you look at what's happening nationally, there's very little information about moisture associated skin damage. So when we did a previous uh, audit in hospitals, and this is just acute data, we looked at over 10,000 patients in 36 different hospitals. And you can see there is a very high number of patients with moisture associated skin damage. So it's not as many as uh, pressure ulcers in this case, it's just over half. But we also know that more of them also have more than one episode of moisture associated skin damage. The most common of them is incontinence associated dermatitis, but we do see the other types of MASD reported as well. One of the challenges we have when we're looking at wounds is the terminology that we use. And some of the words you'll see used here are we're very typical if you're talking about dermatology, but the more you look at the literature around the skin, the more you will hear particular words used. And again, I'd recommend that you look at this document, the Globiad document, which is very much focused on incontinence associated dermatitis. But what's really useful about it is it has this nice set of definitions explaining what it is some of these words mean. And again, it's a free one to download and that's always really helpful. So we need to think about why we worried about moisture on the skin and, and what problems that causes. And the main problem that it causes is that it impacts on the barrier function of the skin. So the skin has lots of different functions. It protects us from ingress of things like bacteria and irritants. But once you start to have a problem of either under or over hydration, what you see is a compromised barrier uh, of the skin and how that affects the whole body. So you can start to lose more water from the skin. You can start to take more water in. You can have external irritants passing into the uh, deeper layers of the skin more easily and you can ex uh, expand external forces. So, for example, if you have overhydrated skin, that can increase the friction forces and cause you more problems with pressure ulcers. So whichever of these we're talking about, there are some key common underlying factors. And you can see there again, I've put those two documents up just to remind you. So I want to start with the most common one. Let's talk about incontinence associated dermatitis. And this describes the skin damage associated with exposure to urine or feces or both of them. And in, in babies and small children, we call it nappy rash or diaper rash or all sorts of other different phrases. But basically what you are looking at is this kind of superficial damage to the skin. And in some people it is just redness. But the most common factor about this is that it tends to be really painful because it affects those very superficial layers of the skin. A lot of the patients describe it as incredibly painful. And as you can see from these other pictures, it can be quite extensive. And that picture on the top left, this is a patient where you can see the really bright red patches. This is a patient who'd been left in really concentrated urine. The patient was dehydrated. They'd had a fall at home and were lying in a big puddle of urine. And you can imagine the pressure damage that's also going to occur underneath that. You sometimes just see the superficial loss. And if the wounds start to become infected or if they become a little bit deeper, you can see patches of slough. The most common differentiating factor between incontinence associated dermatitis and pressure ulcers is, is incontinence associated dermatitis tends to have multiple lesions and it has very difficult to map edges, whereas pressure ulcers tend to be singular or one or two and they have very distinct edges. But you can see with all of these wounds to try and draw around them or to fit a dressing on them would be quite difficult. So when we're thinking about incontinence associated dermatitis, obviously the causal factors are the presence of urine or faeces on the skin. But there are lots of other things that can contribute to that or increase the risk, including things like how long the patient's exposed to that. Are we using body worn pads or bed pads? What's the volume of that urine and um, what medication might they be on? So we know some things affect the urine, make it much more acidic or much more alkaline. Things like mechanical forces, I've talked about friction and positioning of patients, overall skin condition, general hygiene, how mobile the patient is, what age they are, and so on. So you can see there's a lot of factors that play a part 
But what we need to think about is how do they all come together to cause harm to the patient's skin? So if you look at this diagram, which is from an article on the research around incontinence associated dermatitis, you can see that there's kind of four sources of moisture to the skin. It can be urine alone, faeces alone, both urine and faeces, but also let's not forget the impact of frequent cleansing on the skin and the, the kind of solutions, the products you use to, to clean the skin can also play a part in the level of damage and the pain caused to the patient. So when we think about urine, we know we've got urea, which converts to ammonia um, when it's exposed to air, increases the pH and increases the amount of microbes. With faeces, you've got faecal enzyme activity, those very degraded enzymes that start to break the skin down. Again, you've got a high pH and increase in microbes. And you can put all those together and get double the problem. With the cleansing agents, particularly if we are using things like non-pH balanced soaps, you can get chemical irritation. And if people are not careful when cleaning the skin, so if they're rubbing the skin or using abrasive um, cleansing cloths or things like a rough flannel, then that can cause physical irritation to the skin. All of these increase the permeability of the skin and decrease, therefore, the barrier function. If you decrease the barrier function, you've got an increase in microbes, then you get bacterial overgrowth, which can increase the risk of infection. But that decreasing the barrier function and that risk of cutaneous infection all lead to a weakened skin. And then you get the friction and the rubbing the perineal skin over containment devices or clothing or chair surfaces, and you start to see this dermatitis occurring. With IAD, there is a very nice categorization tool which talks about the level of damage caused by the patient. So you can see in category one, you've got persistent redness, but no infection. And then you've got redness with infection. And in category two, this is where you start to see skin loss. So they're differentiating between intact skin with or without infection or where you have skin loss with or without infection. And that helps us to describe the severity in a more consistent way, because sometimes what we rely on is the size of the, the area that's um, harmed, whereas we should be thinking about the extent of the damage that's caused. So we've looked at the skin, we've done some assessment, we've decided what it is, we now need to start to think about what, how we're going to manage it. The most important part is thinking about the cause of the incontinence and what we can do to prevent that. And that can be complicated by a range of factors, including health conditions. So if the patient is diabetic, if they have mobility issues, and that might relate to things like they don't drink very much because they don't want to have to go to the toilet a lot, or it could be psychological factors and that could be fear factors. So they again may not want to mobilise to the toilet because they're scared of falling when they come into hospital or when they're not in their own surroundings. But what we should really be thinking about is evaluating the bladder and kidney function and the intestine and colon function if it's faecal incontinence. And for me, this is one of the things that that gets done least well, we tend to jump to a, a passive solution to managing the byproduct and managing the incontinence itself without working out why it's happened in the first place. So again, you can see a reference at the bottom. This is a really helpful document um, from the All Wales Tissue Viability Nurses about prevention and management of moisture lesions. And this help you to think about why the patient may be incontinent or even understand what type of incontinence they've got. So if they've got stress incontinence, so does that happen just when they sneeze or just when they cough um, or if they want to do something like jump or heavy lifting? Is it urge incontinence? So that's when you really want to go to the toilet and almost from the point of deciding you need to go, that there is no gap between you being incontinent. Um, and that can be have symptoms like frequent urination, urgency and particularly urgency and urination at night. You can have the mixture of the involuntary leakage and the urgency, and that's often associated with exertion. So it's not necessarily things like coughing and sneezing, but it might be picking up something heavy or bending down. And those things are part of daily life. You've got voiding symptoms or obstructive incompetence, which can cause the bladder to malfunction or what you see is the patient not completely emptying the bad bladder. 
Sometimes that relates to the patients having really simple things like being very constipated and that can constrict uh, the bladder itself or constrict the urethra. Or there can be a whole range of other reasons. And then it can be functional incontinence. So things like I mentioned already about poor mobility or poor dexterity and inappropriate toileting. When we think about faecal incontinence, is it about damage to the anal sphincter or to the pelvic floor? We see this quite often with uh, ladies who've had multiple births or traumatic births. They kind of had uh, things like uh, surgery for hemorrhoids. It can be related to the gut itself. So is it related to gut mobility or the stool consistency? So, for example, has the patient got um, IBS or have they got an infection? It can be a rectal pathology like rectal prolapse or rectal vaginal prolapse or fistula. It can be neurological disease. Any patient who has a degree of permanent immobility like spinal cord injury, then we know that affects the bladder, it can be degenerative. It can be as a consequence of constipation. So particularly if the, the patient is long term constipated and has impaction, what you get then is what's called overflow diarrhea, where you have the very hard feces from the constipation, but at the kind of liquid elements manage to scoot round the edges and they leak. We can have lifestyle diarrhea where you've got poor toilet diet. Uh, or a poor diet or effects of drugs. And then there are some idiopathic or we don't know the cause. So if we can understand the cause, we can start to think about how we manage those things. So rather than just jump into the pads, which we will probably still need to do as well, think about what you can do. So can you manage that constipation? What can you do about pelvic uh, damage or improving pelvic floor muscles? But what we most commonly see is the use of containment products. So there's a whole range of things. We see patients using body worn pads, so like the pull on knickers or the pads in the bed. These, in, in my personal opinion, are used too often in hospital. We see them used quite often um, just in case because the patient's in hospital or because the patient's anxious or the ward is busy. And I think we really need to think carefully about what message that gives, particularly to older patients, because it becomes a habit that's very difficult to get out of. Use of urinary sheaths or pubic pressure urinals and containment devices does have a place. Um, and certainly we look to use these external devices far more than we would use an internal device like a urinary catheter. And you'll all be very aware of the cautions around using urinary catheters, how we have to be careful about the, the risk of quality, about causing patients infection and where a patient does have a catheter, the management that goes alongside that, both in the insertion and maintenance and the replenishment of that catheter, checking frequently for urinary tract infections, making sure the patient is appropriately hydrated. We can use uh, things like urinals and absorbent gels, and you can get urinals both for men and women these days. Managing faecal incontinence is much harder. So in patients with things like spinal cord injury, where this is an ongoing system, you can use things like anal plugs. What that does is hold the incontinence in place and you release it on a regular basis. So you are managing the passage of the faeces. You can use the older style faecal collectors. These are very much like the stomachs, so they're external thing that you apply around the anus to catch the faeces. And then if the patient has a very liquid stool, you can use the faecal management systems. These are something that should only be used in particular circumstances, so they tend to be used much more in places like intensive and critical care, um, and they have a lifespan of around 30 days. And they only really work where the faeces is very liquid because they're inserted into the, the uh, lower areas of the bowel. Important elements alongside use of any of those containment product is the skin care. So we've talked about assessing the skin and looking at the extent of the damage. But importantly, we need to be thinking about how we keep the skin clean, dry and well hydrated. So that's maintaining good hygiene, that's regular checking, regular changing of pads, making sure that things like a sheath is, is in place and attached properly, that catheters aren't leaking, checking that if gentlemen are using a, a bottle that they're not spilling and sitting in the urine that's underneath them or the ladies using the, the female version, 
and using simple systems of skin protection. And what I mean by that is making it easy for both staff and patients. So for example, and um, quite local to me, one of the intensive care units that I use a longer lasting skin protectant that you only need to apply twice a week. And rather than having a different day for every patient, they have a mantra that they apply it on a Tuesday and on a Friday. So Tuesdays and Fridays, they apply skin protectant. And obviously if a patient comes in on Wednesday, they would put it on a Wednesday, but they'd pick back up to the Friday. But they make it really simple for the staff to remember when to do it. And I think that's really helpful when we're all so busy and under pressure and have so many patients with quite high care needs. I'm not going to talk in any detail about intertrigo because that's going to be covered by Professor David Fagelli in his uh, next webinar, which is the second in the series. But I just put it in so that you didn't think I'd forgotten it and to give you a chance to ensure that you knew what it was and knew what you're expecting in the second webinar. So that brings me to peristomal dermatitis, and I think this is far less well discussed in the literature. So what we're looking at is where a patient has a stoma in situ um, and the damage, the inflammation of, or erosion of the skin related to the moisture that begins at the stoma skin junction and extends up to about four inches outwards. We know that there are many reasons for this uh, related to that stoma and the principal one being the exposure of the skin to the urine or the stool, depending on the type of stoma that it is. But it can also be perspiration. So if you think about the stoma bag being in situ, that's increased layers and can cause in a increased sweating. It can be an external water source. So Patients with stoma live normal lives. They can have a bath, they can shower, they can swim. But if the steel seal on the stoma wafer isn't good, you can get fluid ingress under there and it can be trapped. And it can also be wound drainage. So very commonly, particularly in acute phases, you'll see patients with a large abdominal wound with either one or two stoma either side of the wound. And you can, can get that exudate from the wound draining underneath the stoma. You also need to think about these, these other um, factors, occlusion, trauma, the age of the patient and how long they are wearing the pouch for. <laughs> There's a variety of classification tools for peristomal wound damage and you can see there are three listed here. But the current wisdom is the ones that exist are not really fit for purpose. So they work in particular patient groups or they work for particular types of stoma, but they don't work consistently across all of them. So we don't have a good standardization system for peristomal, um, um, peristomal problems. Excuse me. And it's important that we do start to think about this because we need to standardize our record keeping. We need to use it as a form of audit so we can guide future care and improve our outcomes. We need to think about when there are problems. So if we are doing Datex or Ulysses or whatever incident report system you've got, and also to help with research. So just to pick back up on that, those four things that I mentioned. Um, occlusion, I mentioned a little bit that you can trap water from external sources underneath the wafer. But actually, by putting the wafer in place itself, you change the level of hydration of the skin. So the majority of the wafers are made of hydrocolloids and hydrocolloids are very good at maintaining a good skin hydration. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but they also prevent moisture escaping from the skin. So you can get overhydration of the skin particularly if your transepidermal water loss is compromised. You can also have trauma from removal of the stomal wafer. And as with any adhesive, if you are removing it from the skin, however carefully you do that, you can get some surface stripping of the epidermis, causing uh, medical adhesive related uh, skin problems. That can also compromise the seal of the stoma. So if you have got some epidermal erosion, then the level of the skin isn't the same. So you can almost get like cracks in it where little rivulets of liquid can get through. And that can be the stomal effluent flowing onto the skin. And once you get that, then obviously you get those chemical constituents as well. With age, with age, we know we see damages, uh, changes in the skin condition. <coughs> 
that can be flattening of the reeti pegs. The reeti pegs are, if you think about a picture of the skin in your head, you'll all be familiar with, you've got the epidermis and then the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue. And where the epidermis and the dermis join, you have a wavy line that increases the skin contact area and it means the epidermis sticks well. It's a bit like Velcro, it sticks well to the underlying dermis. As a person ages, the changes in their skin, but those little fingers flatten. So you haven't got as good a grip between them. So it's much easier to remove the epidermis from the dermis. And then we have the challenge of pouch wear time. So patients sometimes wear the, the pouch for longer than they should, and that can compromise the seal. And there can be a whole variety of reasons why that may be the case. It may be financial, it may be a lifestyle choice, it may just be forgetfulness. The actual sighting of the stoma itself and the use of the stoma can cause uh, additional problems with dermatitis. So thinking about where the stoma is, um, the abdominal anatomy. So if the patient has got a very large abdomen, if they've got a very creased abdomen, thinking about how that sits when the patient is in different positions, whether that's standing, sitting or supine. The location of the stoma on the abdomen, the stoma construction itself, and that can make it much simpler or much harder to get the stoma itself into the pouch. Differences in pouch being used and the changing technique. Uh, differences in temperature, so in summer patients tend to be a lot more sweaty than in winter and that can disrupt the ability of the stoma base plate, the wafer to stick to the skin. And then um, different values and about how much stoma should be spouted and that can be a surgical decision, you know, how much of the stoma they allow to protrude, protrude through the surface of the skin. So when we're thinking about assessing this, we need to think about what kind of a barrier we are going to be using around the stoma, thinking about the size and shape of the aperture, the shape of the barrier, how flexible or firm it is, how much erosion you've got already, and if there's any moisture on the back of the barrier. Thinking about the shape of the patient, is there going to be weight gain or weight loss? Is there any herniation? How long it has been since the surgery? And, you know, with the, the longer you go after surgery, the more the stoma itself settles down, the less inflammation there is around the area. If you're dealing with paediatric patients, thinking about the changes in size and how much that patient changes position. So the shape and colour and texture of the stoma are always important. And then think about how the patient or their family manages this. Who is doing the stoma change? What do they do? Do they do it correctly? Are they... Um, very cautious, or are they more likely to cause skin damage? Have they changed the, their routines? Are they started doing an exercise routine? Are they changed their job? Something that means they're in a seated position. You'll think about what's happened to us over the last few years. Some of you, like me, will spend a lot more time sat at a desk than you ever used to do. I used to be out and about all the time, but now I spend a lot of time sitting. And that can affect the way something like a stoma might sit, or the pressure that might be on it, or it might pull a little bit more. Just a mention when we're in stomas, we tend to think about stoma as abdominal stoma. Don't forget tracheostomies because you can get damage around the neck from the tracheostomies, uh, from the saliva and the impact that has on the skin, because obviously there are lots of enzymes in saliva meant to break down your food. <clears throat> and although it's not a stoma, if you've got an ET tube in, just a mention for that little bit around the mouth because the saliva causes the same kind of moisture damage there. So don't forget that we're not just talking about the abdomen, it can be on the head and neck area that we're talking about here. So the final type of moisture associated skin damage is peri-wound maceration. And this occurs because of the exudate from a wound. Now, we all know that exudate is produced as a normal process of wound healing and that in acute wounds, it's full of things that are really beneficial to the wound. When we move into chronic wounds, we know that in that wound exudate, there are lots of things called proteases. And these are what break proteins down. That's part of their job. So they break down the debris in the wound and that's their function. But in chronic wounds, their function can become inhibited because normally proteases are managed by things that stop them, inhib inhibitors of proteases, TIMPs. And in chronic wounds, there's an imbalance between the two. So what you see, because there is this really 
over or upregulated inflammation in a chronic wound is production of a lot more of the proteases. And if that's in the wound fluid and it's spilling onto the surrounding healthy skin, what you've got are these things that are designed to break protein down on the skin and that's what they start to do. So the skin directly around the wound is particularly vulnerable to moisture associated skin damage if your drainage volume from the wound exceeds the fluid handling capacity of the dressing. So it's really important that you're able to make an assessment of how much fluid the wound is putting out and the capability of the product that you're using to manage that fluid. We can also increase the susceptibility of the skin to that fluid by removing the superficial layers of the epidermis, a bit like we talked about with the stoma wafers. So if you're using repeatedly using adhesive dressings and taking them off and not making sure you protect the skin well, you are removing some of that barrier function. Then as soon as you get some liquid on there, the potential to cause more skin damage is higher. So you can see two kind of components to peri wound uh, fluid problems and you can see on the left there that foot where you've got this little cobblestone bit down near the heel and you'll notice with all of these that what you get is dependent fluid spread so if you think about it it's very logical liquid always flows down so this has gone from the wound down towards the heel because the patient sits most of the day but you can see right around the edge of the wound, close to the wound, is that very white macerated area, very soggy. This is now dead tissue. And then spreading out towards the heel, you can see the cobblestone effect here, where this is prime overhydration of the wound. This is an extreme version of what you see if you spend a long time swimming or sit in the bath and your fingers swell a little bit. So this is very much overhydration. This, however, is excoriation. So you can see this patient either sits up so the fluid flows down or they lie preferentially on this side and the liquid leaks this way. And what you can see this in this much redder damage is that high level of proteases causing problems in that wound. So in terms of uh, peri wound problems, again, the solutions are very simple. It's about good skin care. So if you look at this foot, for example, this looks like this patient has got extensive wounding on their foot. Actually, they've got quite a small area of ulceration between the first and second toes and their exudate has been very badly managed. So they've got pooling of huge amounts of very sticky, viscous exudate in the, the toe cap of their footwear and all that fluid is sitting on their skin. So what this patient needs is some really good hygiene. They need to put the foot in a bucket and clean it. So gently using water and maybe using some soap substitute, get that all off the skin. And you can see there's lots of skin crusting further up here where the exudate has dried onto the skin. And that not only allows you to see the full extent of the wound, but it makes sure that you are protecting the skin as well. So if you know that this is going to happen, once you've cleaned the skin, dried the skin, think about use of skin protections to the area around the wound. Think about um, how often you're doing the dressing change. So you need to optimise the fluid absorption of the product with reducing the dressing frequency where you can so you don't cause that damage from removing the adhesive from the surrounding skin to the wound. So again, we also need to think about why there's more exudate. So, you know, we can talk a lot about, oh, let's manage the fluid, but why is there exudate? Why is there that increased level of exudate? And then think about the contributing factors that that might be. When we are talking about wounds, there are some really common things. So the most frequent thing we think about is, is the wound infected? If there's an infection in the wound, what you will see is an increase in the amount of exudate that occurs. If the wound is on the lower limb, you might also think about the amount of edema in that leg. So even if it's on the foot, is the leg edematous? Are we using compression? The best way to manage that edema is to use compression as long as there are no red flag symptoms. If you manage the edema and reduce the amount of fluid in the leg and foot, you will also reduce the level of exudate because a lot of what's coming out from the wound is that liquid related to edema. If you think about it, it has to go somewhere all that edema and if there's a hole, it will come out of the hole. 
you just can't differentiate between what's true exudate and what's what's called transudate, the liquid that's associated with edema. So managing peri wound is the same as everything else. You have to do a good assessment. You have to understand the causes and where possible mitigate those. And where you can't mitigate them, think about managing the skin locally. So think about your use of adhesives, use skin protectants and make sure the skin is clean and dry. I'm hoping that we're moving away from the real severe phase of COVID, but I know that for many of you, you are now looking back and seeing some of the effects of what happened in COVID. And certainly in terms of skin care, one of the biggest factors was the high number of patients we looked after in intensive and critical care. The increased use of proning, something that was very unfamiliar to a lot of us. And as a movement on from that increased use of proning in intensive care, what we are seeing now is a movement towards use of proning, so self-managed proning in community patients with respiratory problems. So it used to be seen as kind of a, a last ditch attempt with patients with a respiratory disease. But the, the impact that we saw of this during COVID has led lots of respiratory teams to think about using this much more quickly, to use it as a self-management option. So we are seeing patients doing this. And that does mean we're seeing use of different devices. It does mean that they're seeing things like saliva draining out. You do sometimes see some facial edema associated with it as well. And we also had the increased use of ventilation and respiratory devices during COVID. A lot of these contributed to all four of the types of moisture associated skin damage that we saw. And primarily because a lot of these patients were incredibly unwell. So we need to be, when we're thinking about these, thinking about what the risk factors are, the causal and contextual factors. We need to look after any kind of device that goes into or onto the skin, whether that's a tube, whether that's a stoma wafer, whether it's a catheter or whether it's a dressing. We've got to maintain the principles of good hygiene. These are really fundamental to what we do. And looking at what causes the excess exudate, and thinking about the products that we're using to manage them and how that moves the fluid away. We don't want to be using products that hold the liquid next to the skin. Where possible, we should be using products that wick it into the dressing and hold it there, lock it away from the skin. So although we've covered lots of different things around the different types of moisture associated skin damage, it is fair to say that there's now lots of evidence showing that moisture associated skin damage links to other things. So where we have got MASD, we've got an increased risk of skin infection. We've got an increased risk of pressure ulcers because of the impact it has on friction and other things. We need to think about how we have a, a holistic and integrated approach to prevention of skin damage. We tend to focus a lot on managing skin once the problems have occurred, but actually what we should be doing is thinking ahead. How can we instigate good skin hygiene, good skin barriers to prevent that harm to the patients? And I use the word harm very advisedly. We tend to talk about pressure ulcers as a patient harm, but to me, any of these preventable skin problems are harms to our patients. And if we use that language when we talk about them, it might raise the profile and the awareness of prevention and how important it is to get across. And I think for us as clinicians, it's really important that we are vigilant, that we are constantly looking at the skin. We're constantly thinking about what's going on the skin, what might happen if we don't do something. And that we make sure that everybody, whether that's ourselves or whether it's the patient themselves or their family or informal carers, recognise when something is starting to go wrong. So they should be involved in that understanding what good skin care is, understanding what good skin hygiene is and what those early signs and symptoms are so that they flag them really quickly to us so we can prevent further deterioration. Because the risk assessment and the prevention are the key factors in preventing moisture associated skin damage, we can think about what do we do to protect the skin. So firstly manage the cause, but then if you can't manage the cause, if you can't prevent that liquid going onto the skin, what can you do to help the skin pr protect itself? You can use barrier creams, liquid polymers, cyanoacrylates. All of these products create a protective layer on the skin surface 
that maintains hydration levels and it blocks that external moisture irritants. Think back to that diagram I showed you of the skin where you're trying to prevent things from going into the skin. You can think about should the patient be having compression? What position are you putting the patient in? Can you do something about that to help with the flow of liquid? Does it help them with their continence? How mobile is that patient? How safe does that patient feel? All of these are really simple things we can start to think about. So whilst we divide it into those four main things that we've talked about, Let's not forget there are very common contributing factors to all the elements of moisture associated skin damage. It's not just the moisture, it's the chemical composition of those body fluids. It's about friction, it's about occlusion, it's about that trapping that liquid next to the skin. So frequent checking, frequent changing of things in contact with the skin is important. So the really simple things we should be doing are risk assessment, prevention of mitigating factors, and of putting a really simple structured care pathway like that, doing your skincare on certain days of the week, into place to help maintain that skin integrity. And all of that really comes together in the minimised moisture that I know Julie's going to talk to you about in the third of the webinar series. So thank you for your attention. I'm quite happy to take any questions now. Thanks, Jackie. That was a fantastic session, really informative, but also really good practical uh, practical tips um, that I'm sure everyone can can relate to. Um, so, yeah, we have got some questions in the Q&A panel. Um, so let's start with the one that everyone asks is, uh, please, could you send us the presentation after the session or an overview? <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? I kind of said yes, it was, hoping that would be all right. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Um, okay, so Julie, uh, Julie Tyra was was asking. I completely agree about looking at the causes. Without a continence team, without a continence team, it can be difficult to do this. Any suggestions? Um, yeah, it is a really difficult one. I think. Some things are really simple questions. Ask the patient about their incontinence when it started. Was there anything that triggered it? Um, look at patterns. Uh, so just tracking when the patient is incontinent can be a really interesting thing. You know, so if you know that when you go to get the patient up at seven o'clock, they're incontinent and you can tell they've just been incontinent because it's still warm, then then try and go to that patient at quarter to seven. And if you can get them up at quarter to seven and get them on a come out, does that stop them being incontinent? You know, is it that as they are waking up, it happens? So if you wake them up and sit them out, does that help? And um, obviously check for signs of things like have they got infections. Do all the really simple things that we can do before you have to ask for additional help. And I do appreciate that lots of areas now don't have good access to continence teams. Some don't have any at all. At all and that is a real challenge. OK, uh, yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Jackie. So I was just trying to see if I could get uh, get Julie on because uh, I know she's actually on as a presenter if, if she wanted to add anything, add anything to that. Um, but oh, is my microphone working? Sorry? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. It's just with um, I'm guilty, equally guilty um, of like a lot of us. We jump in with the solutions. Uh, but not necessarily look at the look at the why and can we influence some of those maybe not all of them but um it's a very good point very good point to actually ask the patient so if they're able to to to, to give us some information that's a really good starting point uh, and i should say not all uh, acute trust and community trusts have access to a continence uh, team uh, because i know those tissue viability services or um departments who work well with them get really good results that the, the, the really invaluable in this topic and prevent this. But without them, I think as a minimum we do, we need to be at least trying our best to look at the causes and seeing if we can influence them or improve them. OK, Thank, thanks, Julie. Uh, so yeah, so there's a question, question about lymphedema, Simon. There was a, there's um, one that's just come in for lymphedema. How, how about patient with constant uh, skin leakage? due to lymphedema causing severe or extensive MASD? I think the 
the challenge there is that managing the lymphedema, isn't it? You know, getting that patient into the appropriate level of compression. And that's that's really your bottom line in managing that lymphorrhea spilling onto the skin. And, and lymphorrhea is particularly caustic. It can cause lots of damages and patients with lymphedema have that uh, large rolled areas. So somebody's also asked a question about bariatric patients yes. and those cracks. So if you're thinking about lymphedematous legs, it's a very similar problem, isn't it? Where where you get the big folds going down the legs, you get the the liquid sits in the creases. So, you know, in smoothing the leg out, in reducing the edema, that's doing the best you can to manage it. In the short term, whilst you're reducing the lymphedema, whilst you're reduce, yeah, reducing the actual volume of the lymphedema, it's about each time you take the bandages off, making sure you wash the legs well, use some good moisturisation on the skin, give the skin its optimum opportunity to protect itself. If there are areas that are particular at risk, you might want to consider using skin barriers. It's not really possible in patients with lymphedema to cope the whole legs with a skin barrier. It doesn't work very well at all. And, and then getting that limb size and shape under control is what makes a difference. So good compression. If the patient is able to elevate and, you know, for some of these patients with the very big legs, that's very difficult to do. Get the leg up at least to hip level if you can. But I appreciate it's, it's a difficult situation. Yeah. And that, I mean, I take it that, that the question about the bariatric patient kind of overlaps a little bit, doesn't it? I mean, they just talked about the few splits in the skin folds. Yeah, it does. And that is, it's one of those really difficult ones because, you know, we used to do things, really random things like you'd get a piece of gauze and put it over your hand and tuck it in because it was the only thing that was slim enough to get in there. And there are very, excuse me, terrible cough. I do apologise. And um, there are very few things that are thin enough to go into those gaps. You know, you're talking about where you get the cracks. It's right in the crease. So if you lift the abdomen, if you lift the breasts up, whichever it is, and um, it's a real linear crack. And you can't tell if it's the weight of the, the fold of the skin pulling down or if it's the liquid that's right in there. And, you know, when you've got the weight of the fold, it's that little bit of friction movement. So when the patient moves, walks, just moves about, the breast or the abdomen swings ever so slightly mm -hmm. and you get that element of friction damage. So all the literature talks about trying to put an interface in there, you know, trying to protect the surrounding skin. But the practicalities of that are really hard. Lifting the skin well enough to be able to do it is hard in the first place. It needs several people. Getting something that sits in there that doesn't roll up. You know, we used to use talc. We don't use talc anymore because we know it all bubbles and crusts. Um, trying to find something that stops the skin rubbing. So things like the anti-friction uh, fabrics can be quite good. If you can get them in, so if you can get some of that, that will sometimes help. And the tearing that's a problem and we have found that for some patients that makes a difference so I don't know if you've tried that but that might help a little bit. Okay thanks thanks Jackie um, and then there was <clears throat> sorry you, you're breaking up a little bit but I think I think you're okay now um, so I'm interested in whether so this is from Carol I'm interested in whether or not washable containment pants, knickers are better for the skin than disposable single use pads. Do you have any experience of using these? No, that was a quick answer. <laughs> um, logically, Carol, I think it's about it's about what the fabric feels like and how well you wash it. So the problem with the uh, disposable ones is they are disposable. They tend to be from less expensive materials because we throw them away. Whereas the um, reusable ones are when you buy them of a much higher quality. So they tend to be softer, tend not to have many creases. You know, little hint and tip if you're using body worn pads, always smooth them out before you put them on. Simply put them down, smooth those creases make a difference. But it depends on how you look after your washable things. So look at how often they're going in the wash, what temperature they're going in, how they dry. Um, washing powder, what, whether you're using fabric conditioners, which you shouldn't be on them because it affects their absorbency. All those things affect the quality of it. So for me to be able to say, are they better or worse, is not an easy answer because it depends what you do with them, not with what they can do. I think that's the challenge we have. We can't control how people look after things. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Right, I think unless there's any last minute questions coming in, which I can't see. 
I think that is all the questions that that came in. Um, so yeah, obviously we have um, we have another two another two webinars. So if there is a a burning question that you wish you'd asked, then I'm sure you know. Please feel free to either drop it on the the Q and A panel later because I think that will probably remain open. Um, alternatively, add it onto the next one. Um, and obviously we'll try and come back to you with with an answer for, for all of your questions. So finally, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Jackie Fletcher uh, for today's session. As, as I said before, it was a really informative and practical session and hopefully it's given us all food for thought um, in our day to day clinical practice. So yeah, that is it for today's session. Uh, we're back on Friday the 10th with uh, Professor Vogli on the um, on inter, um, dermatitis um, and uh, and then obviously Julie will be uh, Julie and Katie uh, will be on next week for the minimize moisture session and that will be same same time so 12 p.m on uh, on the yeah, Tuesday the 14th of March and then obviously MASD awareness day will be on the 16th of March. OK, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time and hopefully we'll see you on um, Professor Vogley's session on Friday.